everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. It's, um, I hope everybody's had a good Easter, and yes, now it seems the right time to talk about things that are a bit cooler. So I'm going to be talking about icy objects, so basically sharing stories about the journeys that these objects made from Antarctica to Canterbury Museum. And the objects that I'm talking about are ones that were chosen for Canterbury Museum's um, 150 150th anniversary publication and then I'm going to finish the talk by talking about one object that wasn't included in the book which you might have expected to see. So the book The House of Treasures features surprisingly 150 treasures across the whole range of the collection at Canterbury Museum ranging from the largest object that we have which is the blue whale to one of the smallest which is a fairy fly which turns out actually to be a wasp which measures 0.3 of a millimetre long. So we've got, we, we're covering a big size range here. And curators had many discussions about what to include in the book. And of course we had far too many suggestions. And these had to be whittled down to make sure that we covered the vast breadth of the collection at the museum. And there are 13 Antarctic objects in the book, and I'm going to talk about some of those and explain, as I said, how they came to be at the museum. And I'm happy to um, answer any questions at the end of the talk. And to give you some background about the Museum's Antarctic Collecting, it began in 1903 with two bird skins, one from an emperor penguin and the other from an Adelie penguin. They were collected by the 1901-04 Discovery Expedition and dropped off by the expedition's relief ship Morning when it arrived in New Zealand. When the discovery returned to Littleton from the ice in April 1904, the collection expanded considerably with a number of specimens donated or sold to the museum by members of the expedition. These included rocks collected from South Victoria land, as well as wildlife such as Ross, Weddell and crab-eating seals, emperor and Adelie penguins, petrel, skewers and a variety of eggs. Robert Falcon Scott donated one of the expedition sledges and a pair of snowshoes. These contributions to the collection comprise the cornerstone of the museum's historic, heroic, sorry, heroic era Antarctic collection and demonstrate the museum's understanding of the importance of Antarctic science and exploration from its early days. And it's, it is a commitment to preserve and tell Antarctic history that continues to this day. An Antarctic gallery was proposed for the museum's 1970 anniversary wing, and in about 1968, Baden Norris was appointed honorary curator of Antarctic relics. Baden retained his association with the museum for the rest of his life. David Harrifield was appointed as assistant Antarctic curator in 1975, starting another long association with Antarctica and with the museum. Over the years, many other curators have been involved in acquisitions and displays, and the size and quality of the Antarctic collection in both natural and human history is a credit to them. Donations have come from expedition members and their descendants, the wider community through recovery by various means, some of which we might not do today, from historic huts, and there's also been loans and purchases that the museum has made. So the first item I'm going to talk about was a scientific donation. And the discovery of this abandoned emperor penguin egg in a rookery at Cape Crozier, Antarctica on 13th of September 1903 is a testament to the curiosity and sheer bloody-mindedness of junior surgeon, zoologist and resident artist for the discovery expedition, Edward Wilson. Wilson and a small party of men trekked to Cape Crozier on foot to find the southernmost penguin rookery in the world. Unaware of penguins' breeding habits, the men arrived too late to find eggs in the early stage of incubation. And this is when it first became known that emperor penguins bred in the middle of winter. This egg, and it wasn't, which wasn't important scientifically because it didn't have an embryo left in it, was one of a group of abandoned eggs that were taken back to the base at Hut Point. 
This egg was carefully labelled on one side, leaving the other side clean for display. The museum's director at the time, Captain Hutton, was presented with seven eggs by the officers of the expedition, with this emperor egg being the highlight, as it was doubtful that any more of these eggs would be obtained. In fact, more were collected during a winter journey to Cape Crozier, made especially to get these eggs. One of the party, Ashley Cherry Gerard, described this famously as the worst journey in the world. The eggs that recovered on that journey are all believed to be at the Natural History Museum in London. This egg was first displayed at the museum as part of an exhibition of animal specimens from the Discovery Expedition in the Mammal Room at the museum. It is special to the museum because it is one of the first Antarctic donations, it's very early, and because also it had Ed Edward Wilson's label written on it, which is a really nice tangible connection to the man. It's very neat. The second donation is um, connected to community support and community interest in the museum, and this is Deke. And Deke, like most of the dogs on Captain Scott's 1910-1913 Terra Nova expedition, came from eastern Siberia. Deke is an anglicised version of his Russian name, which means wild one. Deke gained a reputation as an excellent sledge dog, with expedition member Dr Atkinson noting that he did every journey requested of him and was without exception the hardest working dog of the lot. Deke's faithful sledging service was rewarded at the end of the expedition and he returned to New Zealand to the home of Christchurch surgeon Sir Hugh Ackland, who was a friend of Dr Atkinson's. When Deke died in September 1920, Doc Ackland had the head of his unusual pet taxidermied and mounted and then presented it to Canterbury Museum. The newspaper reported a few months, oh sorry, I must show you a better photo of Deke. There he is, he's looking much healthier. The newspaper reported a few months later that his head was available to view in the museum's recent acquisitions case. Deke's head hasn't been on display very often, but was recently part of the Dogs in Antarctica expedition, exhibition, sorry, it's a very confusing for curators, those two words, curated by my colleague Jill Haley. A hundred years after it was first displayed, having a mounted dog's head on the wall received a, quite a mixed response, with some people suggesting it should actually be buried. And this Scots Polar Medal is another example of family connections. The Polar Medal was instigated in 1904 towards Scott and members of the Discovery Expedition on their return from Antarctica. As an officer, Scott was bestowed with a silver medal on a white ribbon. On the front was a profile of King Edward VII, while on the back was this image of the ship Discovery and the sledge party led by Robert Falcon Scott that achieved the furthest south record when it came within about 850 kilometres of the geographic South Pole in 1904. And the two silver bars represent Scott's 1902 expedition and then the 1910-13 expedition. Scott's son, Lieutenant Commander Peter Scott, donated these items to Canterbury Museum in 1948, along with Scott's epaulettes, bicorn hat and dress sword. Despite Peter Scott attending the Scott Polar Institute opening at Cambridge in 1935, he chose to donate these items to Canterbury Museum, an illustration of the strong connection that the family felt both to the institution and to New Zealand. This is one of a number of gifts to Canterbury Museum that reflect the ongoing generosity of families connected with Antarctic exploration. As previously mentioned, the late 1960s saw the development of a plan to have a special Antarctic display hall. This was just as well, because a series of large donations were about to arrive. On 4th of January 1958, Sir Edmund Hillary reached the South Pole driving this Ferguson tractor. Hillary and his team had travelled 2,000 kilometres in three of these tractors. Once the tractor was at the South Pole, it is said that Rear Admiral George Dufek 
commander of the US station at the pole, struck a deal with Hillary. He would arrange to fly the New Zealanders back to McMurdo in exchange for the tractors. Subsequently, Hillary was instructed to travel back with Fuchs and the Snowcat, but no doubt the rest of the team were very happy to fly. Hillary's tractor was subsequently used at McMurdo as well as a hack of all work until the 1960s when Lieutenant Morris of the US Navy realised that the battered workhorse could actually be the tractor that Hillary drove. Operation Deep Freeze flew the tractor back to Christchurch and Ed Hillary flew down especially to confirm that it was indeed his tractor. Norwoods, the Christchurch agents for Massey Ferguson, offered to store and restore the tractor until it could be displayed in the Antarctic Gallery, and it has been in the Antarctic Gallery ever since. It's a, it's a very popular display item. Aurora Australis is the first book written, printed and illustrated and bound entirely in Antarctica. Expedition leader Ernest Shackleton developed the project to ward off boredom and boost morale during the British Antarctic Expedition of 1907-1909. It was created during the winter months at Cape Royds by George Marston, Frank Wilde and Ernest Joyce. Although approximately 100 copies were printed, it is thought that only about 25 to 30 were bound. And this copy is known as the Tarctic, from the lettering on the Vanesta board on the inside of the back cover. Other copies have names such as butter and bottled fruit. <laughs> Shackleton planned to sell the books to offset the costs of the expedition, but most were actually given away. Tarctic was given to Henry Nuttall, a friend of the expedition. It came up for auction in London in 1970 and was purchased by staff of New Zealand House at the request of the museum. And the price was 450 pounds, which I'm sure seemed an enormous amount of money then, is the equivalent of about $15,000 today. And the money came from the museum's fund for collection purchases and from the RG Metcalf bequest. And as those of you who are interested in Antarctic memorabilia know, these, these kind of items go for very large sums of money these days. So it's, it, because it is so rare and precious, it, there is the copy that's on display in the Antarctic Gallery is actually a facsimile. It's a reproduction. This is one of the snowcats used by Sir Vivian Fuchs Commonwealth Transantarctic Expedition during 1957-58. They were manufactured in Oregon by the Tucker Company, whose motto was, no snow too deep, and it weighs 3.2 tons. There were, there were three snowcats on the expedition. A was nicknamed Abel and was the one used by Vivian Fuchs. B was nicknamed Rock and Roll, and that returned to its manufacturer in Oregon. C was nicknamed the County of Kent, which is an odd kind of a nickname, but, we'll, but was, and that was unfortunately lost down a crevasse and is now in the Ross Sea. The driver, Lieutenant Cousins, a New Zealander, died, but his two passengers were rescued. After the crossing, Abel was used by New Zealand's Department of Science and Industrial Research for surveying and other work. It was brought back to New Zealand on the Endeavour and gifted to Canterbury Museum in 1971. It was then stored by the industrial machinery firm of Goff, Goff and Hamer until it was placed in temporary storage in the museum's garden, Court, in 1973. <coughs> I love these photos. It turned out to be quite a long period of temporary storage, and it was 20 years until it was removed, restored, and then installed with some difficulty into the Antarctic Gallery. And Beta Norris was instrumental in organising the donation. And it's a very popular display. Most people only get to see the outside of the snowcat, so here's a photo that I found that shows, shows the view from the driver's seat. So it's pretty basic for um, travelling so far. And recently I was privileged to talk with a gentleman from Omaru, I think it was, who had driven the snowcat for surveying work 
in the late 1960s, and he pointed out to me the plywood repair that he'd done on the window. And this was fascinating to me and, and quite emotional for him, and it reiterated to me the, the power of having the real thing on display in a museum. It's a really neat to be able to see the real thing. Just, oh, it doesn't show, I was just gonna see if I could see the plywood repair, but it's on the other side, so if you go up there, you can have a look for it. Another treasure at the museum is the Penal album, which contains 443 photographs taken by Herbert Ponting during the 1910 to 13 Terra Nova expedition. All have captions and many of them have dates. Ponting was one of the first to photograph the southern continent and this album contains many iconic images of the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Despite the extreme conditions, Ponting returned to England with over 1,700 glass plate negatives. He gifted copies of his favourite images to fellow expedition members and the collection in this album shows the party at work, their living conditions, but also has more whimsical images such as this one. <laughs> it's an Antarcticosaurus, <laughs> which is really lovely. This particular album belonged to Royal Navy officer Harry Pennell. Pennell's duties included navigation and magnetic observations. He was one of the men who reported the deaths of Scott and his team members to the expedition's New Zealand agent at Omaru in 1913. Pennell died in 1916 during the Battle of Jutland. The album was loaned to the museum by the Pennell family in 1975 and to the museum's great delight, it was gifted to us in 2015. That this is the knife that Roald Amundsen used for cutting and erecting the pole on which the Norwegian flag was flown at the South Pole on 14th of December 1911. RA is scratched on one side and Sid Pollen 12-14-11 was carved on the other side by one of Amundsen's teams, Oscar Wisting. In 1922, Roald Amundsen gave the knife to Hakan van Hedeman Hammer his closest friend and the financial backer for many of his expeditions. In 1978, Hummer's widow, Obera, now remarried and living in the United States, visited New Zealand and, as she described it, spent a full day in your world-famous museum as the personal guest of the director, Roger Duff. Obera was interested in selling the Amundsen papers collected by her late husband and the knife. Roger Duff was very interested in the collection, but as the museum could not afford $2,000 for the entire collection, Duff raised the idea of buying just the knife. At this time, Ibera wanted the papers and knife to stay together. Roger Duff died suddenly just eight days after Ibera's visit, and the matter could have ended there. But in February 1980, Ibera wrote to Canterbury Museum offering the knife for $1,000. Ibera had been very impressed with Duff and the museum and said that she felt that Canterbury Museum was the proper place for this historic knife. She further said that because Dr Duff wanted the knife so much, I personally feel that the exhibition of it would be rather like a memorial to him. Museum curator David Harrifield followed this up and the knife was purchased with the funds coming from donations made by Peter Scalarup and Sir Robertson Stewart. As Norway is very protective of its material culture, this is one of the few items from Amundsen's expedition that are held in an institution outside of Norway. Now this is the endurance logbook, and it's the first page um, of Captain Frank's Worsley's log and his workbook and it gives giving a collection of navigational formulas, positions of key landmarks, and hydrographic observations from earlier Antarctic expeditions. Canterbury Museum is very fortunate to have the two logbooks kept by Frank Worsley of the 1914-16 Imperial Transantarctic, Transantarctic Expedition. Captain Worsley had command of the steam yacht Endurance, which after safely reaching Antarctic waters became trapped in polar ice from January 1915 until November 1915. It's a long time to be stuck in, well, not quite stuck in one place, but not being able to move when the ship was abandoned. 
Worsley and 27 other men lived on the sea ice for six months before sailing in lifeboats to Elephant Island. Needing assistance, Shackleton decided to try and reach South Georgia in the most sturdy of the lifeboats, the James Caird, with five others, one of whom was Wolseley. Wolseley undertook one of the most impressive maritime feats in 20th century history, navigating the James Caird for 16 days across 1,400 nautical kilometres from Elephant Island to South Georgia, based on just three, the three observations he was able to make because the weather wasn't great. In undertaking this epic feat of navigation, he saved the lives of not just his five companions on board, but also the 22 men left behind on Elephant Island, all of whom were rescued in August 1916. The logbooks were passed on to expedition geologist James Wordy. When he died in 1962, they went to his son, Peter Wordy, Sometime during the 1990s, museum director Anthony Wright began corresponding with Peter Wordy and took the opportunity to visit him in Edinburgh when he was visiting the UK. In the year 2000, James decided that the country of Worsley's birth was the right place for the log books and donated them to Canterbury Museum. And not only are they, they're, I mean, they're really amazing to have and to see, but they've also been uh, the subject of several scholarly articles about Frank Worsley's navigation and the methods he used, which are not used today, so they're of interest to navigational historians, and those papers have appeared in Canterbury Museum records. In 2008, the museum became aware that Apsley Cherridge Garrard's silk sledge sledging flag, which was carried on Scott's 1910-13 Terra Nova expedition, was being auctioned by Christie's of London. Cherry Garrard's flag was made for him by his younger sister, Ida, in the weeks before he set sail for the south. He was only accepted just five weeks before, before the expedition sailed, so his sister had to make the flag quite quickly but she took the time to go down to Kensington School of Art to learn a special new stitch that looked the same on the front and the back of the flag. The flag was carried on the depot journey, the winter journey, the polar journey, the dog journey to one ton depot, and on the search journey, so it was well used. It can clearly be seen hanging on in this ponting photograph of Scott's birthday dinner on the 6th of June, 1911. Uh, it's one of these ones here. So that's really neat that we have the photograph and also the flag. The museum's, museum's Antarctic curator, Natalie Cadenhead, prepared a proposal suggesting that the museum bid on the flag. Her rationale was that expedition flags are considered to be iconic items, representing not only the endeavour and hardship but also the pride and patriotism associated with these heroic era expeditions. Canterbury Museum holds one sledging flag related to Scott's earlier discovery expedition that was made for the geologist Ferrer. The museum did not have any sledging pennants relating to the Terra Nova expedition, and these flags really come onto the market. The flag also had excellent provenance having been passed down through Cherry Garrard's family. The memo was approved. The auction was at Christie's in the UK, as are many auctions for Antarctic material, which means that curators sometimes find themselves blearily holding the phone in the early hours, hoping that our accents can be understood. In this case, the bidding was done by curatorial manager at the time, Jerry Champion, who stayed up till three in the morning and successfully bid the equivalent of New Zealand $92,000 for the flag. So you can see how prices have increased um, over time. Now my final story, I'm going to finish by sharing the story of an object that didn't make it into the book, the James Caird Primus. This was one of the objects that I was tasked to write about, and I was pretty excited about this. I'd used Primus cookers on camping trips when I was a child, and I was familiar with the story of Shackleton and the Endurance. According to the museum's records, the stove had belonged to the Endurance carpenter Harry McNeish, who was one of Shackleton's crew on the epic journey from Elephant Island to South Georgia in the James Caird. 
The stove had been donated to Canterbury Museum in 1975 by Cameron Jelly. When I began researching more details for the entry, I started to discover problems. For a start, the stove wasn't actually a Primus, which is a brand name. The 1914 Primus looked something like this. So you can see it's quite a different looking stove. The stove at Canterbury Museum was a Comet Scout number no. six, made by Hugo Moller of Sweden, and has a tank beside the burner rather than underneath it. While searching for information on that stove, I happened on an online discussion forum for enthusiasts of classic camp stoves. <laughs> and it is a thing. It is a thing. <laughs> I found that there had been a discussion about the provenance of Canterbury Museum's stove in 2003. The discussion finished with information from Robert Burton, former director of the South Georgia Whaling Museum, and who'd spent a considerable amount of time researching Shackleton's journey. And he said, two primer stoves were taken on the James Caird to South Georgia, according to Shackleton's equipment list. One was taken by him, Worsley and Crean, on the crossing of South Georgia and jettisoned when the fuel was used up. So after the James Caird landed on South Georgia, three of them went, walked across the mountains to get help. And they took a stove with them, and then when it ran out of fuel, naturally, they dumped it. The second primer stayed with McNeish, McCarthy and Vincent, who camped under the upturned James Caird until reached by the Norwegians. The men in the boat were taken back to England, and there is a photo of the boat and its equipment lying in a boatyard in Liverpool. The primer stove of the ordinary kind, with the burner on top of the reservoir, is clearly visible. It is not the same as the Comet stove that belonged to McNeish and is currently at Canterbury Museum. So this was pretty conclusive information from a reliable source. So next, I looked at McNeish's life. After leaving South Georgia, McNeish travelled back to the UK on a whaling ship, and then he worked for various shipping companies before moving to New Zealand in 1925. According to one account, Harry ended up working on the Wellington waterfront, but after he was injured and unable to work, he became destitute and had to sleep in the wharf sheds. The dock workers, who knew of his role on the endurance expedition, made a collection for him and organised for him to go to the O'Hero Benevolent Home. McNeish was at the home for a couple of years before he died in 1930, five years after he came to New Zealand. McNeish's diary of the endurance expedition was donated to the Alexander Turnbull Library by a Mr Fathers of Wellington College five years later, so that was in 1935. The stove was donated to Canterbury Museum 45 years after McNeish's death by Cameron Jelly, a Wellington civil servant who was 19 years old when McNeish died. There is no information about how Mr Jelly came to have the stove. Evaluating the evidence, I think that it is very unlikely that the stove at Canterbury Museum is the stove that was on the James Caird. I, like many of you, am genuinely sorry that it isn't. It's, it's, it's a wonderful story. The stove probably did belong to James McNeish, but where and when he acquired it and where it was used are unknown. And maybe that McNeish had taken the stove with him on the expedition as personal property and had managed to retain it somehow, but I think that that's doubtful. Wherever it came from, it is actually a beautiful stove with its dents and solder, but sadly, due to its doubtful provenance, it couldn't be included in the museum's anniversary book. Now that we have this new information, Canterbury Museum is working towards updating the Shackleton display. And I've shared the story in an attempt, because it's kind of a great mystery, which I love, um, but also an attempt to illustrate the kind of work that goes into checking the provenance or history of an object and how complicated that can be. And it also helps to explain why curators ask so many questions when an item is offered to the museum. So um, if, ever, if ever you think, oh my gosh, why do they want to know so much? That's exactly why. So all of the stories around the objects that I've shared today illustrate the varied ways in which Antarctic objects have found their way to Canterbury Museum. As much of the exploration in Antarctica has flowed through Christchurch, Canterbury Museum is a fitting home for these items. 117 years
years after receiving its first Antarctic objects, the museum is still excited about them and we're looking forward to the opportunity to both broaden and add new stories and related objects to a redeveloped Antarctic gallery in the redeveloped museum. Thank you.